Uh, so like Jignesh said on Monday, and maybe Andy said last week, I don't know, uh, they're both traveling today. I'm Matt, I'm a PhD student, I work with Andy. Uh, the last time I gave a lecture for this class, I was a first year PhD student, and now I'm hopefully a final year PhD student. So hopefully this is a, a, uh, a nice bookend on, on that, that process, we'll see. Uh, so with that said, let's, uh, let's talk about joins today. Um, a little bit of administrivia to get out of the way first. Uh, homework two is due tonight. Homework three is due on Sunday. Uh, and the midterm is next Wednesday. This lecture is the last uh, lecture for material you will be responsible for for the midterm. There's going to be a lecture next Monday, but it will not be covered on the midterm exam. Make sense? Uh, if anything looks wrong here, uh, it's above my pay grade, so you'd have to take it up with the course staff, but th these are the dates and, and, and stuff that I was, I was given. So let's talk about uh, the context for why we need joins in the first place. Um, so we, we pray at the altar of Ted Codd and the relational model in this class. So that means we're going to reduce duplication of our information and separate our, our information into relations, into different tables, but when we want to query that information and combine and make useful queries out of it, we have to join stuff, so things like customers and order tables or students and classes tables, those sort of classic examples you see in, in textbooks. And if you were paying attention to the database world 10, 15 years ago, which I'm guessing no one here was, um, the NoSQL systems were all saying, joins are stupid. We should just you know, denormalize all of our data, save a bunch of time. We don't need to do joins, and then it turned out a lot of people who adopted NoSQL systems ended up building joins on the application side anyway, which caused a lot of redundancy and slow systems, and, and, it, and it didn't really work out. So from Andy's perspective, from our perspective, the relational model won again. Um, and another reason joins are important is systems like, like analytical systems for OLAP systems, hopefully you've heard that term before, um, they're going to spend 20 to 50% of their time just working on joins. Um, transactional systems, that's that's not true at all, but for analytical systems, this is where they're going to spend a lot of their time. So using the right join algorithm, um, getting the right join order, this is all going to be probably the high pole in the tent that's going to determine your query runtime. So we, we need to make sure we get, we, we get joins right. So in the lecture today, we're just going to focus on a class of joins called binary inner equijoins. Basically binary, we're going to join two relations. Uh, inner equijoin, we're going to compare two attributes from each, or an attribute from each relation, and if there's an equality there, we're going to emit sort of a, a concatenated tuple from, from that, uh, that satisfies that, that predicate. Um, these sort of joins can be modified to support, or these algorithms can be modified to support other sorts of joins, depending on the sort of predicate you want to do, so range scans, anti-joins. Um, I think the textbook generally just refers to this class of joins as like theta joins, where maybe you're not using an equality operator. Um, and, and like I mentioned, these are binary joins where we're only worrying about two relations. Uh, Multi-way joins exist mostly in research literature. Um, it, it was the case that, that SQL Server added support for this sort of stuff in like 1998, and then eventually they decided that was a terrible idea. It made performance unpredictable, and they ripped it back out a couple of years later. Um, as far as we know, relational AI is the only system these days that's really still playing with, with multi-way joins, but you, but you will see it in the research literature. Um, at the bottom here, there's a little bit of terminology we're going to reuse throughout this lecture. Um, we're going to talk about left tables and right tables and outer tables and inner tables. Um, here we're just making the statement that the smaller table we want to be the left table or the outer table, which doesn't really mean anything to you yet, but it'll start to make sense as we discuss the algorithms that are in play here. So we're back to looking at query plans that we've seen before, this notion of you know, in the, in the early lectures, we talked about how we turn SQL into logical operators, and eventually we're going to turn them into physical operators. So in this setup, data is going to start all the way down at the leaf nodes, uh, at our relations, tables basically. Um, and, the, and the data is going to flow all the way up through this relation. And then there may be a filter on, uh, like in this case, there's a filter on S. And then it's going to reach that join operator. And that join operator is going to do a comparison. And then it's going to emit tuples uh, based on uh, tuples that satisfy uh, the, the join predicate. And so next week when we start talking about query execution, we're going to talk about like the granularity that we're working at. I'm saying tuples sort of vaguely because it may be the case you operate one tuple at a time, you may work on vectors of tuples, but that's sort of going to be design decisions we'll talk about next week. 
And then at the root of the node, you're going to get the final, or the, or the, the root of this tree, you're going to get the actual uh, results of the, of the query plan. So when we're designing these join operators, we have a couple decisions to have to think about. Like, wh what do we actually output um, from these operators to, 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 their, to their parent nodes? And as well as, like, how do we reason about what the cost of these operations are going to be? And these are typically implementation design decisions. These are not sort of things you change on the fly in a system. When you're sitting down and you're designing, how do I want to build my database system and how is data going to flow through these uh, query plans? You, you sort of have to reason about these sorts of things of like, what are the inputs and outputs of these join operators going to be? Um, and so at a very high level, let, let's just take, for example, this, this join operation here where we're looking at uh, ID in, in relations R and S. When, it, when it's doing this comparison, I sort of alluded to this earlier, the outputs can vary based on sort of the processing model, tuple at a time, vectors. Um, it's also going to depend on the storage model. So I think earlier in the class, you guys talked about NSMs versus DSMs. Um, can anyone remind me what that is? And there's another term for, for when we talk about NSMs and DSMs. Yeah, exactly. So, so row stores versus column stores. So depending on how that data is organized and how it's flowing up from, from the base tables, um, that's also going to inform how you implement these, these join operators. Um, and then the last is, is sort of the data requirements in the query, depending on if you want um, the sort of what, what operators are existing above these, these joins uh, is also going to change sort of, sort of what you want their inputs to actually be. So let's, let's talk about that, that the, the first design decision, which is what comes out of these join operators. So the first example, or the first uh, design choice you could do is an option called early materialization. So the idea is you have tables R, table S. We're going to do a join on ID for those. And we're going to materialize all of the values. So we're going to do the comparison. And wherever those IDs match, we're going to create our output tuples. And we're going to send them up through the operator tree. So they're going to continue to flow up to that projection, which is then going to project the information that we actually want. The nice thing about this is you never actually have to go back to the base tables to, to get your data again. So you do one trip to, to storage, and you start sending your tuples through the query plan and eventually to the root node to produce your result. This could be, like, like all things in database systems, there are trade-offs to these sorts of design decisions. This could be a bad idea if your tuples are extremely wide with a ton of attributes, uh, because you're effectively copying potentially more data than you actually need if, one, the Join selectivity is going to be pretty low, or you're eventually going to filter that stuff out anyway, depending on the projection that's, at, that's closer to the, to the root of the, the plan tree. Um, if the table's wide, but only one tuple uh, matches, it, it's, it's actually it's not as big of a deal, depending on how early you, you sort of do these sorts of these projections. And this is also opportunities here for where you can actually push down these projections to sort of reduce some of that, that uh, waste. So the key idea here for early materialization is these subsequent operations never really have to go back to the base tables to get that information. So you sort of have predictable IOs based on, you only need to know the size of your tables because you're going to scan them once, materialize your data, and send them up through the query plan. The other option, as opposed to early materialization, is late materialization. So in this scenario, we have tables R and S again. And we do the comparison, except this time we're only going to output like record IDs, or, or in something like a Postgres, like a tuple ID, um, some sort of ident unique identifier for what tuple in the base table satisfies this, this join. But you're not actually going to materialize all the values that you need now. Um, so as these continue to flow through, at the end, you see here, we actually need this C date field from the, the base table S. You have to go all the way back to storage to get that now. So you've, you've got these tuple IDs. You know what satisfied your join. You know what you eventually want to output at, at the root of this query plan. But you have to go all the way back to the base tables. And this was pretty common for, and, and sort of popular with column stores maybe 15 years ago. Um, because for them, it, it made more sense to only um, look at the data they needed to just rip through the column that you were doing your, your join evaluation on. And then eventually, you just go back and you materialize the, 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 the data that you actually need at the very end. Uh, in practice, I, 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 I won't say this is less common, but we've at least heard from one of the, the major big column stores, uh, one of the early ones, Vertica, 
that was sort of a commercialized version of C-Store. Um, they basically initially did late materialization because they're like, this is a great idea. And then similar to like the, the multi-way join thing, uh, when the research community says something might be a good idea in practice, it becomes kind of hard to predict and reason about what the um, total I.O. cost will be. Because here in this case, you don't actually know what your total I.O. is going to be until you get to the output. You, like, it's hard to predict because you don't know how many tuples will satisfy the, uh, the join predicates and any sort of other filters. And so at the end, you have to go back to I.O which is sort of hard to predict ahead of time. And going back to I.O. is actually getting, despite storage getting faster, is getting harder and harder in the, the era of sort of disaggregated compute. We're pushing uh, storage off to uh, separate storage nodes and cloud environments. So now you're often going across the network to get your data instead of just to a local disk. So this notion of early materialization is probably more common these days. Um, so that, that's early materialization versus late materialization when we're, we're looking at table scans for joins. Yeah. Right, so the question is, where does C date sort of get materialized to when you're doing query evaluation? And then, like, is it thrown away at the end? Is yeah. that sort of the question? Yeah, it, it sort of, that's a system design decision. Chances are uh, you're going to, you know, like a knob you can typically set in, in database systems is just like how much work memory does a, does a single query get to use to sort of store a scratch space and stuff like that. They're going to use typically their own scratch space for that sort of information, and then it's probably just going to be lost. Um, unless you explicitly wanted to sort of, uh, there are things called views. I don't think Andy's talked about those yet. I don't know if we cover views in this class, but, but there's this notion of views and materialized views, where if you know you're repeatedly doing this sort of um, querying and you want to sort of maintain that information, you can, you can create those in the database system. Um, if we don't talk about it in 445, we talk about it in 721 for sure. Um, yeah? I'm confused why the unpredictable IO Right, so the, the question is, late materialization should always be less I.O. than uh, early materialization. For a column store. For, for at least for a column store. Um, maybe, but um, there's also the case of like round trips hurt and latency hurt. So in the case of like, it may be like, Early materialization wins because you just sort of get the benefits of prefetching. You just s rip through all the data. You send it across. You process all of it at once. You keep it around in memory. Um, you get typically more cache locality from that sort of stuff as opposed to having to sort of make round trips back and forth to storage devices where your latency starts to become uh, the pain point uh, rather than just sort of sequential I.O. And interleaving that sort of stuff gets a little trickier too, right? Like, cause, And again, reasoning about contention in a system with early materialization, your query is going to rip through your tables, materialize your information, and you're done. Like that query is probably not going to have to go back and like hammer storage as hard for for the base table information as opposed to late materialization is going to keep kind of ping ponging back and forth between like okay I need this, go get that from the table, and, and, and sort of these round trips get harder to reason about I think. Cool. Oh, yeah. So I have another thought about why. Uh early materialization might be more uh, resource efficient. Is it because, or is it related to when you're performing the join, you're uh, fetching all the pages sequentially anyways, and if you materialize it right after the join, then you can take advantage of uh, the buffer pool uh, manager and it's still fresh, you can take advantage of more locality. Right, so, yeah, so his statement is early materialization may benefit from locality because if you're ripping through all the data already and then if you need it further up the, the query plan, like it's already possibly still in the buffer pool or the OS page cache if someone uses that, like Postgres is the only one left. Yeah, you would benefit from caching there as well if that were the case. Um, so the other thing we talked about uh, sort of these, these when, we, when we're thinking about design decisions for these joins is, is how do we reason about costs for these sorts of things? And I alluded this, to this a little bit earlier. We're mostly going to be focused on the cost of the I.O. for these joins. We don't really compare, we don't worry about the compute as much. Um, so in this case, uh, we keep going back to this notion of there's a table R and there's a table S that we're joining on in this query over here. And I'm going to say that there's big M pages in R with little m tuples and big N pages in S with little n uh, tuples, 
And we're, we're going to cost through this entire uh, lecture, we're going to cost these algorithms in the notion of, of m and n pages and, and little m and n tuples. Um, and like I said, we're going to ignore the compute cost. That's a controversial statement to some people because some people are like, okay, well, some of these algorithms are O n times n and others are O n plus m in, from a compute standpoint. Um, but in reality, I.O. is still a high pole in the tent for most of what we're doing in these database systems. Unless you're doing an in-memory database system, um, then you may make some different design decisions. But we're really trying to design or reduce I.O. here in these disk-based systems. Just as a brief aside, there's this very naive way to do a join, which would be like a cross product or, or a Cartesian product. So like uh, in, in the SQL standard and some database systems, I think, offer something called a cross join, where you can basically just create this Cartesian product of, of two different relations. And you could, if you really wanted to, implement uh, a join that way by just sort of then creating this gigantic Cartesian product of these two tables and then filtering down to the ones that you actually want. But in practice, uh, that's a terrible idea. and I. Do, I to be honest, I don't know why anyone ever use a cross join, but it exists. Um, all you can really do is just create two for loops that run through the two tables, and it's going to be wildly inefficient. And I, unless you were trying to create just like specifically doing something like testing that needed a Cartesian product of, of your, your data, I don't know why you would do that. Um, so here's a brief overview of, of the algorithms we're going to look at today. Uh, there's, there's sort of three classes or, or groups of algorithms. The first we're going to look at is the nested loop join. Then we're going to take a look at the, the sort merge join, which is slightly related to the external merge sort algorithm we looked at uh, with Jignash on Monday. And then we're going to talk, to, talk about what's probably the, the most important one, which is the hash join, um, and spend a decent amount of time there. Um, in practice, um, hash join is generally going to be the fastest, for, uh, anal particularly for analytical systems. OLTP, like these transactional systems, are typically not doing gigantic joins. So they'll do something simpler, like an index nested loop join. Um, and it may be the case that if you have like a sort by in your query, you may want to do the sort merge join. Right. I forgot to warn you guys about that. Yeah, they're testing an emergency alert system today at 2.20. So it must be 2.20. Yeah, they're, they are a little early. Yeah, that is quite annoying. All right, we've got a couple more still beeping. A couple more. Oh, God, they're still going. <laughs> Yeah, all right, we're good. I forgot to warn about that. I knew that was coming. <laughs> there's, there's always one. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the big takeaways here is there. There's no one-size-fits-all solution in database systems. Depending on the task at hand, the query, your data distribution, the, your system design, different joins are going to make, the, make, make, uh, make sense at the right time. Because like, if your query has a sort by, you want, might want to do the, the, the sort merge join. Um, but like, like I said, OLTP likes to use nested loop join. You can get pretty far with just a nested loop join for a transactional system. MySQL didn't get a hash join until like 2019 because they could just do nested loop joins. Or uh, I have a theory, actually, I'll discuss later with, with the sort merge join. And Andy hasn't confirmed this for me, but I, I think it's true. So we'll just take it as gospel. Um, <laughs> so we're going to start with the naive nested loop join. I, this, this will actually give you a better idea when, when I was talking about, <laughs> again, um, the outer table and the inner table and sort of where that name comes from, right? So if, if you were sort of naively trying to design a join algorithm where I said, OK, for every tuple in R and every tuple in S, I just want to see do their IDs match. The simplest thing you could do is just write a for loop for this for this outer relation, and then compare it to every single uh, relation in the inner table, and then go to the next tuple and then compare it against every single tuple in S and emit that. And so 
that's also where the name of our, of our outer and inner tables is going to come from. You'll sometimes hear they're referred to as the left and the right table. The left table is usually the outer table. The right table is the inner table. That comes from sort of the query plan view that we usually think about. Um, and when you talk about optimizers, I think in the future, um, they, they reason more about left and right trees and use that terminology a lot more. Whereas like, I feel like people living in the actual uh, operator world think about outer and inner tables. So it should seem obvious that maybe not, but uh, this algorithm is bad because we're doing a ton of work. So we know we have to scan every page in M. So our cost up front is we know, we know we're eventually going to have to go through every, every page in, in, in table R. But then for every tuple in R, we're going to have to, to look at every page in N. So the cost here is astronomical unless these tables are very, very, very small. Um, so for example, let's, let's put some numbers to this. Table R has 1,000 pages with 100,000 tuples. Table S has 500 pages with 40,000 uh, tuples. And that's going to cost us 50 million IOs to do just a simple nested loop join. And there's sort of a, a straw man presentation here of, a, okay, if you do a millisecond per I.O., that's going to take 1.3 hours. That's ignoring, ignoring caching entirely. There's no notion of an OS page cache here. There's no notion of a CPU cache here. This is just if you had to go to disk for every single page to do this operation, that's how long it's going to take you. Um, and then if you switch the order of the tables, uh, you get about a 20% savings in, in uh, your I.O.s and your execution time. So that's sort of a brief tease into why Optimization is going to be important in the future because even just something as simple as getting the join order right on these can have a big difference in um, the query execution time when we go to actually run these. Oh, yeah, the last thing, these numbers are actually quite small. If you had four kilobyte pages, this is only about six megabytes of data, which again, this would fit in L3. So these are very small tables. This would fit in your L3 cache. You would actually be able to rip through this very quickly with a nested loop join. So this is sort of an example of like, maybe you could get away with an index nested loop join if you know your tables are very, very, very small. Like you don't need to do anything fancy um, if you know they're going to fit in cache because tables that small do exist uh, in practice. So if, if you are doing a, a very simple join, it may be the case you, you would want to do a nested loop join. But in general, we consider this bad in the common case. So how can we do better? We'll, do the, we'll use the notion of, of locality here. Uh, I mean, that's pretty common when we're designing uh, computer software systems. So instead of just iterating for every single individual tuple in R and ripping through all of S, we're only going to do it for each page uh, in R. So that's going to reduce uh, the cost fairly significantly. So instead of, uh, we're still going to have to pay this upfront cost. You know you're going to have to go through all of R. There's no getting around that. But instead of little m times n, so basically every tuple looking at every page uh, in S, we're only going to do it for every page. And that's going to save us a, a bunch of IOs. And when, we're, when, when the optimizer is choosing the, the, the join order here, ideally we want the smaller table to be the outer table. And when it's reasoning about this sort of stuff, we're determining that based on the number of pages, not the number of tuples. Number of tuples doesn't necessarily relate to the number of disk IOs. We're more worried about the number of pages it's going to have to fetch from disk. So imagine in the case of, OK, you have your buffer pool. You have B buffers available total. We're going to use B minus two buffers for the outer table. That's because we're going to use one buffer for the output of the join. And we're going to use one buffer to sort of stream the other uh, inner table. Does, does that make sense when, when, I, when I say like we're going to like basically we're going to try to use as many buffers in the buffer pool for the outer table. And then we're just going to keep two set aside for this for the output from the joint and the others just kind of going to be completely churning and ripping through S. And if we do that, uh, yeah. OK, so we'll get, to, we'll get to the I.O. cost here. So again, we've got M. So this is the case where, where the tables don't fit in memory. We have to rely on our buffer pool. And you can only hold M divided by B minus 2 in memory at a time. Uh, you multiply that by N. And our cost here 
if it fits in memory, is only 1,500 IOs. In that case, it's only 0.15 seconds. I think we were over an hour under like sort of the straw man argument before. So it's a dramatic drop in IOs. Um, my clicker is not behaving, I think. There we go. And then if it doesn't fit in memory, then we have to rely on a buffer pool that has 102 buffer pages, which I guess he did that to make the math easier because two are going to be reserved for the inner table and the output. Um, you get 6,000 IOs, and then, it, and then if the optimizer were to switch the, the join order, you get 5,500 IOs. Okay. Still. So, the nested loop joins kind of just, oh yeah. Sure. So why do we want to bring the, the, um, the pages from the outer table into the buffer pool instead of the inner ones? Because it seems like we're leaping over the inner ones a lot more than the outer ones. Uh, you would end up swapping back and forth, I think, if you had the inner table as the one that you wanted to try to fit into memory, right? Like, uh, so, so if we're looping over the, the outer table, like let's say we take this first block of the outer table, mm -hmm. uh, and then bring the rest of the inner pages into the buffer pool. Like, are, we, are we going to get rid of that first block of, in the outer table as soon as we're done with it? Yeah, but we can sort of coordinate that our own by just sort of like pinning it, I guess, or... Um, because like the, the inner table is always just going to be streaming through over and over and over again. Right. Um, and so wouldn't you want that to be in the buffer pool if you're going to stream over it? If, you keep, if you're continually getting stuff from it? Um, Imagine the size of the book are really giant. Right? It doesn't, doesn't matter if it's super big. Well, if it's super big and you keep the stuff in the outer loop inside of your buffer pool, right? Then like your second loop will be giant. So you're, you're going to have to replace that every time because you can't fit all of it into memory. You, you Whereas you can fit a block. Yeah. So you're going to thrash. Yeah. yeah. Ah, I see. Okay. Whereas, Thanks. Whereas in the outer loop, there's less chance of thrashing because for each outer loop iteration, you're going through this many inner loops. Right. Makes sense. Cool. So yeah, like, like I was saying, the, these, these nested loop joins are, are basically just sort of a brute force. Like you're going to sequentially scan through the inner and the outer tables, in the inner tables case, over and over and over again. And that's sort of what we're, we don't have a choice if we don't know anything really about the data. If it's, there's no order here under the relational model. Um, but if there's an index, we can use that to help us out here. So. Hopefully, if we're lucky, and this is, this is where, uh, particularly true for, for OLTP systems, if we get an index, we can choose an index and we can do an index uh, join instead. So, so what does that actually look like um, if we're, if we're gonna, gonna use an index to do a join? Uh, the clicker's giving me grief again. So in this case, for each tuple, R and R, let's get used to that being the outer loop. Uh, basically, there's, there's no getting around looking at each one of these, but instead of, having to iterate you know, one at a time and then looping through and doing a sequential scan on the inner table, we can just do an index probe, assuming we have an index on SID, which would be great. Um, hopefully that's the primary key on that table or something like that. Um, and if there's a match in the index, then we can omit that tuple. So we basically remove looping over and over again around the inner table. We just have to do index probes. Um, for, for the tuples. So in this case, uh, we sort of hand wave away and say that the, the cost of an index probe is some arbitrary constant C. Um, that's because we don't actually know what it would be based on sort of what type of index it is. If it's a hash index, we're looking at something that's more constant time as opposed to like a B plus tree. So you're, you'd look at something logarithmic. This also, you know, I, I said hopefully this is maybe, well, this can't be a unique index because I see duplicate values there in ID. So that's not your primary key. Um, there could be duplicates in this index. So it may not be exactly some um, beautiful data structure specific, uh, you know, this is exactly how long this operation will take because we don't know the data distribution inside of this, this index, but we sort of hand wave that away as being some constant C. So the cost gets reduced to uh, big M, you still gotta look at everything in R, and then the number of tuples in, in R times this index operation, this index lookup. Yeah. 
two primary keys, right? So your question is, this only works if you're joining on primary keys. Um, oh, like whatever, key, whatever ID is stored in the index? It, it would have to be some sort of key in an index. It ha yeah, exactly. It doesn't have to be a primary key. You can have secondary indexes. Um, but it would just have to be something that has an index on it already. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's unique or, or sec uh, what, what the constraint is there, but if there's an index, the optimizer will try to choose this. Um, and this is really, uh, you know, I mentioned OLTP systems mostly try to just do index nested loop joins if they can. Like most transactional systems, like if you see your queries doing sequential scans, you, that's a hint that that's something you just want to build an index on and your transactions will run significantly faster. In the case of hash joint, is the uh, DBMS just on the fly building an index on the inner table? Right. So, I mean, that, that's a great question. The question was, like, is in a hash join, is it just sort of building a hash index on the fly? Yeah, this is sort of foreshadowing how a hash join works as well because um, it's basically an index join, but it's going to build a hash index on the fly. Um, and I think... I think SQL Server also, like, if it does an index, or excuse me, if it does a, 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 it can build sort of indexes on the fly as well if it benefits from this sort of situation where I think it's called a spooled index, um, where it can sort of, yeah, sort of as you alluded to, a hash join is going to build the data structure and then probably throw it away. Um, they can be smart and sort of keep that stuff around if they think it's, it's going to be useful for future queries. Um, but yes, this is, this is sort of foreshadowing what's going to happen in a, in a hash join. So, some takeaways from, from nested loop join. Um, pick the smaller table to be your outer table. Try to get as much of it into memory as possible. And when you have to, you're going to have to, you, you have to loop over the inner table. And ideally, you have an index on the attributes that you're using for the join key because that's going to save you a whole bunch of time. Um, and so, and then we, we looked at sort of the naive, just two for loops. That's where the inner and outer table name comes from. Block uh, nested loop join looks uh, takes benefit it benefits from locality, uh, and then an index nested loop join. Sure. So the question is, if we already have a B plus tree index, do we create a hash index uh, if we want to do the index nested loop chain? Yeah, so the, the C isn't, it's, it's, it's some vague constant, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the index is a constant time lookup. I think Andy's just using the heavy lifting here of just saying there's some constant. If it's a B plus tree, it's going to be actually, like, like you said, logarithmic. Um, so I don't want to confuse uh, the issue when I said, like, this is foreshadowing a hash join. We, we don't build an index for an index nested loop join. We're relying on an index that already exists. If there's a B plus tree there already, that's what we're going to use. The hope is the optimizer wouldn't then build a hash index on top of it, probably. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any scenario where you would want to do a hash join when a B plus tree index is there, and I, and I can't think of one. Because um, a B plus tree also gives you the nice um, ordering as well, um, which you may or may not need in the query results. Does that make sense? So like I said, we got our takeaways here from, from, the index nested loop, or from the nested loop join and then the different, different algorithms we have within those. They're not always a terrible idea. Uh, for, again, for transactional systems, uh, it, it makes sense. Uh, and also, if the tables are really, really small, just do a nested loop join. So let's talk about the sort merge join. And the sort merge join, the basic idea, there's two phases here. In the first, you're going to sort both tables. Using an, you could use an algorithm like the external merge sort that, that Jignesh talked about on Monday, but, but all we really care about today is these two tables, they're going to be sorted. You use your favorite sorting algorithm. Um, we're not reasoning too much about today how you make that happen. That's what Monday was for. Um, and then in the second phase, okay, you've got these two sorted tables, and you're just going to create cursors in each one, and you're just going to go in order and try to look for, for matches. And the nice thing that this ordering gives you is, you don't have to start all the way at the beginning for the inner table every single time you're, you're, you're go as you're working down the outer table. So the, order gives, the ordering here gives you some, hopefully, uh, guarantees you don't need to backtrack as far. There are degenerate cases where you actually have to backtrack all the way back to the beginning every single time, and this sort of falls apart and turns into a, a nested loop join. 
or uh, yeah, a nested loop join, but we can talk about that in a, in a minute. So I hate seeing code on a projector or pseudocode, but we're just going to step through this really briefly. So step one, like I said, we're going to sort the two tables, R and S. We're going to create cursors, and, and we'll step through an example here in a moment. So don't worry about grokking all of this right now. Uh, you get cursors at the top of, of each sorted uh, relation, and you're just going to advance those cursors uh, based on comparing the equality keys for greater or, or less than. And then if you have a, a match as you're sort of iterating through, you omit that. And then there are scenarios where you're going to need to backtrack, and we'll give an example of that in a, mo a minute. So again, this is, this is more for your reference when you're studying and, or, or need to understand how, how a sort merge join works. Let, let's go through an example, because I think it, it, it's more helpful. So once again, we have tables, R and S. Step one, sort them. Beautiful. Um, this clicker has given me so much grief today. Initialize cursors to the, to the beginning of our sorted uh, relations, and we're just going to do a comparison. We're going to say, does SID match uh, uh, RID? It does. Emit that tuple. Go to the next tuple in S. So we're still sort of working with this outer table, inner table notion. Um, we're just going to, you'll see how this, this ordering helps us reduce how far we have to backtrack. We don't have to start all the way at the beginning when you, when you move to the next, relation, uh, the next tuple in R. We'll do another comparison. That's also a match. We'll emit that tuple. Beautiful. And we'll advance the cursor to the next one. And so now we see that, that SID is now greater than RID. So we need to advance the cursor in the outer table. And we do another comparison, and we see that there's a match, and we emit that tuple. Advance the cursor again. Once again, the, the SID is now greater than RID, so we're going to advance the cursor in, in, in table R. And this is a scenario where we have to backtrack. We've advanced the cursor in R. We're still less than the inner table's value. So we have to back the cursor up in the inner table. But unlike a nested loop join, we don't have to go all the way to the beginning. We're relying on this ordering to, to not have to go as far. Go back to 200, do a comparison. It's a match. We emit that tuple. Advance the inner cursor again. We're now less than 400 to advance the outer cursor. We don't have to backtrack on the inner table on this one. We're still less than uh, at the outer cursor. The, the, the RID is less than SID. So we're going to advance the cursor again. Do the comparison. Output that tuple. We're going to advance the inner cursor. Advance the inner cursor. Aha. We advance the inner cursor. We do another comparison. RID is less than SID. Advance the outer cursor. We get a match. We output that one. And we're at the end of SID. This example, for some reason, there we go. Yes? Are we backtrack, are we going, we're backtracking to the very first occurrence of, like, for example, there's only one 200 here, but if there were multiple 200 in the, in the table, right. we backtrack all the way to the first 200. So the question is, if there were multiple 200s in the inner table, would you backtrack to the first 200? Yes. Because you have to compare now this sort of second 200 in the outer relation to the, the inner relation. Make sense? Yep. So you like back back to the first occurrence of the previous, like with the previous index. Yeah, so, so the question is you backtrack to the occurrence of the, of the sort of the outer uh, cursor's uh, value, I guess. Yeah, that's basically how far you would have to backtrack. Anything that could possibly still satisfy that equality predicate, you have to make sure you backtrack far enough. To check so, that. So how are you going to sort that? Since you'll have to like, know where each of the unique occurrence of index is. Right? So the, the question is, how are you going to store that? Um, you could basically memoize that, right? Like you could basically just keep track of, OK, when I'm at a new cursor value here, where was the first place I had a match in the inner table? So that the next time you have to advance this one, you just jump right back to that one. You could, you could I could probably hold a record ID in a, in a variable, right? Just a 32-bit integer or something like that to hold the record ID in this table that just knows how far I have to backtrack to for, the, for this current cursor. Oh, you only use the one. It's the, the outer IDs, current index. That's the one you need to store. You need to store 
the index or the tuple ID or the record ID on the inner table for how far you need to backtrack to for the current outer key. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Did, did that check out for everyone else too? I, I'm not making that up. Okay. You guys are going to have to call me on this. I've never given this lecture. So if it sounds like that's not right, tell me if something doesn't pass the smell test. 20 minutes later? Yeah. So you only backtrack when in the outer join the IDs are equal, right? Uh, and the, so the question is, you only backtrack in? The case where the outer IDs are equal when you move to the next cursor? Uh, only when it's equal. I guess I'm a bit confused why we didn't backtrack when we hit 300 and R, and we're still at 400 and S. So in this one? Yeah. So. We Yeah, like nothing satisfied the, the join predicate for 300, so we probably wouldn't have it cached that anything was there that we need to, to jump back to, that there was no index for that in the, in the, in the inner table. Yeah, it's just an op probably an optimization. You, you wanted to go back to the pseudocode or? Yeah, uh, just one second. Oh, okay. So it's in the scenario where you have to increment the outer table's cursor. You need to know potentially how far you need to backtrack on the inner table because you may have advanced past tuples that would still satisfy the join predicate. Yeah. Cool. So how do we cost this thing? Uh, the sort cost for, for RNS comes from the lecture on Monday, and so I'm not going to discuss that math because math is scary. Uh, and the merge cost is you just have to look at every single page in both relations. So it's just M plus N. Uh, so in this case, the high pole and the tenth is going to be typically the sorting process. Um, and we'll get some clicking going again. And so again, here's our, here's our hard numbers um, with, our, with our, I think those table sizes have more or less stayed the same. Uh, if they haven't, that makes this difficult. Um, we've got the sort cost. That's going to be 4,000 IOs for R. For, two, for, for S, it's 2,000 IOs. And then the merge cost is only 1,500. Add those up, 7,500. And again, this sort of straw man IO cost of one millisecond per, per access to the disk it's going to take less than a second to perform uh, the sort merge join. So I mentioned this before. Uh, there's a degenerate case here for the sort merge join where what if every attribute has the exact same value? So you're going to pay the cost to sort it all, uh, and then you're still going to have to, like, you're going to have to backtrack also on every single iteration on the inner table. Um, and this will just to sort of devolve to a uh, nested loop join, plus you paid to sort it first. So in practice, if someone makes a, oh, this shouldn't happen. Uh, if someone makes an attribute column on a big table that's all got one value and they want to join on that, um, and they did a bad job. Uh, and then there are also other things in database systems we can do to sort of help us out here. There's things called zone maps. There's, there's other things we can know about these, the, the distribution and the cardinality of, of an individual column that would maybe help us know, hey, don't sort this column. It's a column that's just a billion ones or something like that. Uh, database systems sort of usually, we, we usually have uh, things to stop people from doing something too crazy like that. Um, so when is it useful? Uh, it would be great if one or both of the tables is already sorted on the join key. That would be beautiful. Um, or it may be the case that you want your output ordered uh, for, for the eventual output. So in case of an order by clause or something like that, the, the database system may say, well, I'm going to have to sort this anyway. Uh, I might as well just go for a sort merge join. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be sorted first. It could have been an operation below, like an index probe that's like a B plus tree that provides ordering. It could be producing uh, the inputs. These may not be base tables underneath. They may be index probes or something like that. 
that could be producing ordered data into the operator and then the optimizer will know I could use a sort merge join here because my inputs are already going to be sorted so I don't have to pay the sort cost. Did you have a question? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, this, so sometimes if the optimizer knows stuff coming in is already ordered, and this was this was sort of the, what I alluded to earlier that that Andy hasn't actually confirmed for me. Like MySQL, I mentioned got the hash join in 2019. Not not. It sounds like it got a disease. Uh, it, it, got, it, it they added hash join support to, to MySQL as late as 2019. Um, MySQL storage engine is in ODB and it always clusters its data on a primary key. So if Tables are commonly being joined on the primary key. Well, one, you probably have an index anyway, but again, in ODB is also sorted already. It's already basically clustered. Um, so they may have decided in, for a long time in MySQL, we can just always rely on index or sort merge joins, and we don't really need a hash join. But eventually, they came along and added it. Um, which gets me to the hash join, uh, the big one. Uh, so the basic properties we're going to rely on here is, okay, if two tuples or if tuples in, in R and S are going to satisfy the join predicate, the hope is they're going to have some, uh, if we've picked a reasonable hash function, if you hash those values, they're also going to hash to the same value. So we can rely on a hash table here to uh, make, our, make our lookups more efficient. And I'll show you how that happens. Um, and in, in some cases, we're basically on the fly going to build a hash table on the outer table, and then we're going to do lookups on the inner table using that same hash function. And whenever there's a, there's a match, we emit a tuple. Um, there's an allusion here to partitioning and stuff like that. We'll get to that. We're basically talking about what happens if uh, buckets start overflowing or your hash table doesn't fit in memory. But the basic idea is you're going to build a hash index, like you said before. You're going to build a hash index on one of the tables. And then on the other table, you're just going to scan along, apply the hash function, and if you get a match, you're going to emit that tuple. So there's two phases here. We've got the build phase, which I described sort of briefly a moment ago. You're going to scan the outer table. You're going to apply some hash function. You're going to build a hash table. Um, choose whatever hash table you want, but uh, I think you guys have discussed hashing already. Uh, in this case, you generally want to work, use linear probing. Uh, and then in the probe phase, you're going to go along the interrelation. You're going to hash each tuple or on, on the, the join key. And anywhere you get a match in the hash table, you're going to emit that tuple into the query plan. So what does this look like? Step one, build hash table. And then for each tuple in S, I think I've said this a few times now, but I, I, like, I like to see it with the graphics. Um, OK, so we're going to build the hash table, scan all the way through R uh, using, this, using hash function one. And then we're going to apply the same hash function to the second table, or the second relation. And then anywhere there's a, there's a, there's a match, we emit that tuple. So what is in this hash table? Uh, one, you, you need the key. You, you have to keep that around from the, the, the join key. You can't just build the hash table and then just keep like, uh, just a record ID sitting there with it. You have to keep the original key because it may be the case that there's a collision on this hash function and you still have to do a comparison of was this a real match? Just because I hashed to the same value in the hash table, you still have to do the key comparison just to make sure it, it wasn't sort of like a, a spurious collision or any sort of like uh, uh, misplaced uh, tuple in the hash table that had to like move for linear probing. And then this gets to sort of the discussion earlier we had with earlier versus late materialization. Do you put the value in the hash table with it? Maybe. Uh, some people put just a, a record ID again. It depends, like all things in these systems designs. It just depends uh, on what works best for, for the system that you're designing, whether you want to materialize this and keep it in the hash table, and that's sort of going to become the canonical materialization of the data that you need to go back to later, or uh, if you just want something that, re that is like a, an entry or an offset into uh, something you may have materialized already, uh, a, a different memory buffer. Um, so we have a brief discussion now of, probe fil uh, uh, of uh, what's called a probe filter uh, that relies on a data structure called a bloom filter. There's a much longer example in, an, in 
fall 2022. So if you really want to see how how a bloom filter works, like going to, to sort of the, the the bit logic and stuff like that, um, we we've pruned it for time. But um, th they're pretty interesting data structures. The basic idea with with this probe filter is before you do the hash table lookup, you look in this data structure that checks to see if the key is going to be present. Uh, in the hash table because it's typically a much smaller data structure. These these bloom filters can typically fit in a CPU cache, so you don't have to, uh, yeah, it, it's just gonna be much more efficient typically to use a, a bloom filter to do a lookup first than it is gonna be in a, in a, in a, in a hash table. Now, you, you may be wondering like, okay, well, why wouldn't you just use a bloom filter instead of a hash table? It's because these are probabilistic data structures, so they can have, um, they can never have a false negative. They're never going to say, oh, that is not in the set. But it's possible they could do a false positive and say, yes, this, this lookup that you're doing is in the set, and then you have to go to the hash table, and actually that's your ground truth of whether it's actually going to satisfy the join predicate. Um, but in practice, these, these bloom filters can, can save a lot of hash table lookups. So what does that actually look like? We're joining A and B for some reason, because why? It's not R and S. Uh, but we're joining A and B. And while we're building our hash table on A, we're also going to build a bloom filter. Because we have to scan the data anyway. And then when it comes to the probe phase, we're going to first look up in the bloom filter if the tuple and if the, the key attribute in, in B satisfies the bloom filter. If it doesn't, you move on to the next one. And then if it does, only then do you go to the hash table. Um, the reason this is helpful as well, again, in a disk-based system, these hash tables may not fit in memory. They may have to spill the disk, which we're going to talk about very shortly. But this will also sort of motivate why something like a bloom filter is helpful um, to sort of prune out uh, hash table lookups ahead of time. Clicker. There we go. So as I alluded to, uh, what happens if you don't have enough memory for your entire hash table? Um, hash tables are, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, uh, even if the hash table can fit in the memory, bloom filter will still be faster than hashing and then checking in the hash table. Is that because you're just doing a bit operation? Generally, generally, yeah, you, you're still going to probably want to do the bloom filter lookup first because it's probably going to have a better chance of staying warm in your, in your CPU cache than like depending on your hash table implementation, they're not as cache friendly where you're gonna have to jump around through pointers, especially for like linear probing and such. Um, we, we usually would probably just do the bloom filter lookup first, but I think even in memory systems often rely on, on bloom filters um, before they do a hash lookup. Yeah. So would we have like one bloom filter for the entire table? Um, one bloom filter for the entire table. So it's, it's a data structure in this case that they're going to, uh, so the question is, would you have a bloom filter for the entire table? That was the question. Um, if you're doing it the way it's described in sort of the previous slide, um, where it's built on the fly, you're just building this bloom filter on the join attribute. So whatever that, that predicate is. Uh, in practice, uh, systems sort of keep these these bloom filters around again as supplemental data structures they sort of build them as they go maybe like a uh similar to to i think i mentioned zone maps before but there's an optimization that database systems may sort of build these on the fly to help uh with with other query execution sort of like an index as well um but for this example here where we're just talking about how you could use a bloom filter as a filter in a hash join you just build it dynamically just on the join attribute and then you discard it I'm gonna, and then I'll come back to you. So previously we talked about index nested loop join. Yep. And if we use hash index there, uh, is that actually different from hash join? So the question is, we talked about index uh, join before, and if we use a hash index for that, is that different than this? Conceptually, not really. It just happens to. It just depends on when is the hash table being built. So what I'm describing here is sort of an ephemeral hash table. This is used for for query execution and then is generally discarded. Whereas if you're using a, a hash join, you're relying on a sort of a, a permanent data structure or permanent uh, sort of a persistent data structure uh, that 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 uh, it can reuse over and over again across multiple queries. So uh, I have a follow up on the bloom filter. So if I remember correctly, if you build a bloom filter on uh, on 
all of the rows on the attribute value of all of the rows in the relation, then the probability for a false positive is slightly higher than say you have two or three Bloom filters uh, built on a subset of the rows of the attribute value. Is that a viable option? So your, state, your statement and, and question is that, that from your recollection, if you, instead of building a very large Bloom filter of a very wide one that incorporates all like sort of the, the, the tuples attributes, it's better to sort of uh, layer Bloom filters based on different individual <laughs> attributes or a subset of the attributes. Yeah. Um, in practice, yeah, Bloom filters are often multi-layered uh, with, with how they do these sorts of things. Um, I mentioned that there's, we, we talk about Bloom filters longer, I think, in, in last year's version of this lecture. There's also a link to, to like a Bloom filter calculator that can basically say, for how many keys, for how wide is the attribute, uh, how big does my Bloom filter need to be in order to give me some sort of bound on, on false positives? Or, and you can sort of play with the numbers. Um, or you could, yeah, you could Google Bloom filter calculator. But yeah, because they're probabilistic data structures, there's trade-offs here. With, with you're, you're going to trade off space versus uh, false positives. Cool. Yeah, Bloom filters are cool. Uh, there's, there was also, as just as an aside, there was, a, there was a research project here with one of Andy's students about six or seven years ago called SURF, succinct range filters, and they're a very similar concept. They're basically a probabilistic data structure. Bloom filters only allow you to test on is something in the set or not in the set. Uh, this basically was like a Bloom filter, but for range uh, queries. And it's actually been pretty widely adopted in, in quite a few systems since that paper was published a few years ago. Um, so if you're interested in Bloom filters, go read the SURF paper. Um, so as I mentioned, what happens if your hash table doesn't fit in memory? So uh, okay, cool. I thought there was a question. And that's where something called the partitioned hash join comes in. We're going to basically uh, partition the, the table first, and then we're, we're going to basically probe within each partition. So we're sort of like, uh, or, yeah, I don't know how to describe this without just using the word partition again, but we're basically going to segment these, these relations into, into small chunks that allow us to, to keep this sort of in, the information that we need in memory. Um, you'll hear it referred to sometimes the, the Grace hash join. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a project out of the University of Tokyo, I think, yeah, in the 80s. Um, this was something called a database machine, and which I guess is a link. I don't know where that links to. Um, but it's sort of this idea of you had these very special purpose uh, computers that were designed just for database processing. They would design hardware specifically just to compute things like joins. And uh, ultimately, what, what killed it in the 80s was Moore's Law. Uh, you would spend a year, two years, three years designing this specialized system that could process your database uh, queries. And by then, Intel had put out the, the, the next generation of x86, particularly when you get to the 90s as well. Um, and it crushed you in performance. At that point, we were still getting so much faster uh, every year or two. So that sort of killed the database machine idea then. Uh, uh, th this is an example of, of one that Andy knows of, again, from the 80s. Uh, this was from Britton Lee, I think. A and yeah, I, I don't know. Andy finds it amusing to do just sitting in a tie using a database. Uh, <laughs> But, but this idea came around again, like, like, like a lot of things in database systems and computer software systems and just this field in general. This idea came around again, and, and you had these, these companies like, like Teradata and Atiza. Probably the most well-known uh, database uh, machine was, was Oracle's uh, Exadata. And you could buy these million-dollar racks full of very specialized hardware. And what sort of made them database machines is they were putting specific hardware in there for query processing, things like FPGAs, uh, specialized CPUs. Um, what what kind of has what kind of what took the steam out of uh, this wave i think was um the cloud era so we went from because there was a there was a brief window where this seemed like a great idea right with death of moore's law um we're getting reduced uh gains in cpu year over year and people like specialized hardware yes this is the solution um but then people got less interested in specialized hardware and running on prem they wanted to run on commodity hardware in the cloud um there's still Highly specialized systems like Yellowbrick exists. Um, we did a we had a seminar series talk from them about a year or two ago on the YouTube channel, uh, which is really interesting about how they built sort of a specialized database system, um, and now they've deployed it in a cloud setting that's bordering on like a unikernel design where they basically boot the operating system and then they never make another system call again, and the database system owns everything. It's it, it's a pretty cool system. Um, so if that's interesting, there's a seminar talk on that on. Uh, 
the database group's YouTube channel. Uh, back to the partitioned hash join. Uh, this slide is exactly the same. Uh, so the basic idea is we're gonna we're gonna hash this into hash the the outer table R into into a sequence of buckets. We're gonna use the same hash function on on the inner relation S. Uh, to create buckets of its own. And what you can do is you can now spill these buckets to disk because um, we're using the same hash function here. Keys that hash into, into uh, sort of this, this first bucket from, from table R, um, we only have to compare sort of uh, bucket at a time. We don't have to worry about keeping this all in memory as we do the comparison. So you can just go down through these buckets, do the comparisons, and then you, you emit those tuples. You don't have to worry about uh, to, uh, keeping all this, the entire hash table in memory. And in this case, you would want to use a different hash function when you're comparing the two, or you could just sort of directly compare the, uh, you could almost do like a, a nested loop join inside of these buckets, depending on how big they are. You don't actually need to worry about hashing again. But if you were hashing, you would want to use probably a different hash function. Um, so there's a few edge cases here. Uh, what if a partition doesn't fit in memory? Uh, well, then you have to recursively partition it. Uh, you have to choose a different hash function for that specific bucket, create more buckets, and hash those. Um, and there's also this option where, like, if the single join key has so many matching records, sort of the degenerate case I said before with, with the sort merge join, um, the hash join is not going to really help you here because everything's going to hash into the same bucket, and then you're going to have to do secondary hashing on all that, and that's also going to probably hash into the same bucket. So this would be a this would be a, there's sort of degenerate cases here uh, that that you have to reason about with a hash join. So what does rec recursive partitioning look like? Uh, in this case, we have this first hash, fun hash function on R, and we have a bunch of tuples that are hashing into this bucket, and that's causing a problem for us because this bucket's now full. So we're going to actually have to, there we go, throw a second hash function at, at this bucket one. And then you end up with bucket like one prime, one double prime, one triple prime. And then you're going to go hash uh, table S. And the important thing to note here, you have to make sure, even if, even if this bucket one weren't going to spill for the inner table, you have to do the double hashing now because we have to make sure that tuples that hashed into this bucket with the second hash function after spilling, we make sure we check those from the inner relation. If you, if you only hashed once or if you didn't do that, you, you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to, to look at all the data you needed to. You don't want to accidentally skip anything. So what is, what is the cost of a hash join? Um, in the great case, and you don't need recursive partitioning, uh, it's just three times looking at every page. So we had the partition phase where you're going to read and write both tables. Uh, M plus N IOs, and you're going to have to do that twice for the, for the read and the write. And then in the probe phase, you're just going to go through each table one more time. Um, interesting. I was just thinking it's interesting that we actually reason about writes on this uh, Join algorithm when we, we generally have not really thought about writes or outputs. Um, so again, we'll put the same numbers on it. What does the cost analysis look like? 4,500 IOs in this case, 0.45 seconds. Um, I just wandered too far, I think. Wait, did I get a real number? OK. So if the keys are skewed, we have this pro oh yeah. So the question is, if you have to do the recursive partitioning, how do you reason about the cost? Yeah. Uh, my answer to that is this is the only thing you should be responsible for on the midterm. And I will make sure that that's true with Andy. Because as far as I know, it's not in any other slides. And we don't actually put any sort of cost on the recursive partitioning. Um, it's hard to say in practice, because when you're talking about recursive partitioning, it's dependent on your data distribution at that point. Um, like, like I said, the degenerate case is everything hashes into one, and it sort of devolves. Um, you, could, you could probably 
Yeah, without noting a data distribution, I don't think you could actually put a reasonable sort of um, approximation on it. Maybe someone in the YouTube comments will tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. For the recursive hashing case, do you like hash block by block, or do you finish one, go to the second one? Because it could be that in the second hashing, you also have scaling, and you have to rehash the first one. So what's the order you're using? Yeah, so the question is, what order do you do this in? And, and, and because in the second hash, you may have spilling as well, right? Yeah, that you didn't take care of in the first one. So in practice, yeah, I, I don't know what a real system would do here. Um, in practice, you very, very rarely would ever go beyond two rounds. It just doesn't seem to really happen. Um, but it's a good question. Um, and it's, it's a good thing to think about is like sort of these degenerate cases when you're actually implementing these sorts of things. Um, but in practice, um, you sort of, uh, Andy can bleep this out. Yes, right. Right, so his statement is, the whole reason we're here with a partitioned hash table in the first place is the outer relations hash table didn't fit in memory. So we're gonna have to spill that. And while we're building our inner hash table as well, that's gonna have to spill as well, I guess. So like as you're streaming it, you're reading or it. Or streaming it, sorry. You're reading it, you're, you're reading one, one, one page at a time and you're writing one page at a time. Like that's how I think about it. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, in the absence of us having any sort of constant here of talking about like the buffer pool size and introducing some constant B and, and, and reasoning about that, I think the notion of just sort of streaming a page at a time from each table is, is probably the right way to think about these algorithms. Because this is sort of in the absence of, it is a little bizarre that sometimes we talk about what this would do with a buffer pool and what it wouldn't, but when we're, when we're generally just thinking about these algorithms, we, we're, we're just thinking there's no buffer pool. Um, and just what, it, what would be the, the I.O. cost. So there's an optimization we can do in the case of sort of very skewed keys. Is that time right? Yeah. So we have 11 minutes, is that right? Okay. Um, if your keys are very skewed and you, and you notice a lot of things going into the, in sort of the same buckets, you can, you can have this notion of, of a hot partition where you basically just say, okay, these keys are, are hashing over and over again to this same partition. And you can sort of, it's sort of like similar to the notion of, of pinning in a buffer pool. You can basically say these partitions should stay in memory and you're going to do sort of comparisons immediately. You're not going to worry about these sort of separate phases of, of a build. In a probe phase, like you can basically, as you're as you're doing the building, you you could you can compute that you could do the the some of these comparisons on the fly. In in practice, it, it's not really done. It, it's pretty difficult to do, and and, and uh, but it, it, you will see some notion of a, of a hybrid hash join sometimes in in, in literature. Um, so that's why we're just sort of presenting it as something that that could exist here in the notion in the case of, of highly skewed data. This is sort of an alternative, I guess, to like spilling those first those first buckets and, and, and creating like ever growing buckets. Like you could do an optimization here and just say keep those ones in memory and start doing our comparisons as at, on the fly. Um, so we're we're gonna wrap up, I think, on hash joins. Um, in this case, the inner table can be any size, and ideally, we would love for the outer table to fit into memory. That that would be best case scenario so this is another example of like this is something the optimizer needs to try to get right table size isn't actually usually that hard to to reason about like that that it can actually get right um and then if we know if we if we know the size of that outer table we, we could use something like a static hash table and we don't have to worry about resizing this thing if it gets to a certain size like we can just basically pre-allocate the buffers that we need for this hash table. We know based on this table size that I'm going to need this big of a hash table and not constantly have to, to rehash. Otherwise, we have to use like dynamic hash tables um, or allow for things to like spill into like basement pages of this hash table. Yeah. Um, so looking at this, we want the outer table to fit into memory. Uh, that I'm assuming will be uh, taken care by the buffer pool manager. Uh, now, I'm having a hard time like thinking about it end to end. So suppose we get a new query, we want to do a join. Uh, now, do we have a buffer pool pre-allocated for like join queries or queries like these, or do we try to fit it in a larger buffer pool? How, how does that, uh, that work? Right. So his question is, 
if a query comes in and I need space in my buffer pool to, to run these sort of hash joins, like is that memory sort of reserved for you or, or how does that work? Um, Generally, it's a knob you can tune in these database systems of like how much space do you set aside for 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 working memory in that in the buffer pool for things like hash tables and stuff like that. Um, other systems may allocate it on the side as like a separate buffer pool or something like that just for hash joins because they may be able to say, okay, based on concurrency in the system, we, we can reason about how much contention there would be for that data structure. But it, it's sort of a system design implementation uh, a decision. Yeah, but always a good thing to be thinking about. So how come we call the outer table, we, we call the one that is the hash table, the outer table, but then for index nested loop, the hash table one is like the inner table? So the question is, why do we call the outer table the table that has the hash table built for a hash join versus when I was talking about an index nested loop, loop join, the inner join is the one that would maybe have the hash table on it. Yeah. Um, so the... I don't want to get too fixated on that inner table on an, on, a, on an index join being a hash uh, table or a hash index potentially. Like in practice, it's probably going to be a B plus tree. So I don't want to like confuse those those two ideas for you guys. In general, it's like the outer table in the index join is the one that's true, but in the hash join, the inner table is the one that is true. So I was wondering why that was the case. Um, so for a nested loop join, you would. Still, maybe size. Like it, with, with hash joint, the other table is smaller, so the hash table is smaller. It's more likely to fit into memory. Whereas with the uh, with the index join, the inner table is larger, so you would want to use an index to uh, uh, to speed up per per outer key lookup time. For example, if you use a B plus tree index on the outer table in the index join, and your inner loop has more iterations, then your total lookup time would be higher than compared to you use each key in the outer loop and you probe it into an index in the inner table. So I think it's slower to probe the index every time. So it is slower I would think you to probe the index every time, but you're probing it uh, a smaller number of times. I mean, you're stream like I think it's better to stream the larger table. This index. I think we can talk about this. Yeah, I mean, and, and and so in hash joins, we typically also just refer to like, again, it's like an implementation thing. Like they they love to overload the terminology of like you have your build your, you have your build side and you have your probe side of your tables. Like they don't necessarily always reason about outer and inner tables. Where like your outer table is your build side, your inner table is your probe side. Um, so it, it's the terminology gets a little weird, especially like you said when you're dealing with an index join, a nested loop, uh, index nested loop join, where like the inner table is the one that's relying on the index or has the index already. Um, but that's yeah, that's just the way the terminology has has wound up. Yeah. Um, so generally, hashing is probably going to be the better choice, like unless you specifically need ordering. Um, the hash, hash joins are usually going to be the way to do it. There's a lot of modern analytical systems that just sort of default to a hash join. They don't even bother reasoning about anything else. Um, the note here says good DBMSs use either or both. So like a more traditional like transactional or, or just general purpose all around system like a Postgres, uh, they're going to support all these sorts of joins. Um, whereas like highly specialized systems, highly, very fast transactional systems will focus on index joins and OLAP systems will, will typically use hash joins. Uh, so next class, you guys get to start talking about uh, how to actually execute these queries. Um, that's going to be on Monday. And then like uh, the initial slide said, you guys have a midterm on Wednesday. So good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, this shit is gangsta. Boys are gangsta. Uh -huh. Yeah, nothing but gangsta. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the pop.
poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cooked up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 is send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great. <laughs> 